everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming today for workshop number three. Um, we'll just go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so um, we'll do really quick in introductions. Um, but this week's topic, uh, we're talking about a um, few things under plant care. And hi, Wells. Um, we're going to hand it over to Emma to talk about um, watering, fertilizing, um, best practices, and then going over some common um, pests and diseases that you might be seeing now or start to be seeing within the next few weeks. Um, and then, of course, we'll take some time for any of your questions and answers. Um, and then also just a note, um, we're going to try to make these a little more adaptable to your schedules on the weekends. Um, we realize the nicer it gets, the more folks want to spend down outside. Um, so we're going to be making these workshops um, fit within like a smaller um, time frame of about 30 minutes. Um, and then, you know, you can always send your Q&As anytime after that and until the next one as well. Um, so uh, Emma and Jose will introduce themselves, but my name is Kateri Zuni, and I'm the Associate Director for CSC, and I run the Sembrando Salute program along with our team here, um, and welcome again. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Emma Dewey, and I am the Farming and Gardening Manager for the Center of Southwest Culture, and uh, I will be leading the workshop for today. Hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Jose Manuel Castro Lopez. I'm the program coordinator for Sembrano Salud and Codice. It's great to have you here today. Great. So just jumping right into it, um, as Kateri said, today's workshop is going to be on the topic of plant care. Um, so to get started with that, we're going to talk about a couple of the most important uh, pieces of taking care of plants, which are watering and fertilizing. So as we know, water is extremely important for plants, um, but finding the right balance for how much water to use is the key. Um, actually having too much water can be just as um, destructive to plants as having too little water. Um, either one too much or too little can put a lot of stress on plants um, and it creates an environment where basically plants are not able to thrive. Um, too much water can cause root rot. It can introduce a lot of bacteria into the soil um, that creates more disease opportunities. Um, of course, having too little water, that's going to dry out your plants. So it's gonna prevent them from being able to function properly. Um, and either way, um, will usually lead to um, fatality of plants. So having the right balance, super, super important. Some of the ways that you can um, help find the right balance um, is to make sure that you're watering at the right time. Um, if you're using drip irrigation, watering in the evenings is gonna allow plants to get that deeper drink of water overnight without having the risk of water evaporating or um, going up into the atmosphere from too much wind, um, other things like that that could occur by doing overhead watering or using sprinklers. If you are using sprinklers or overhead watering, watering in the morning will allow plants to dry off. Um, obviously you want the soil to stay moist, but having wet leaves and foliage and fruits um, can be a bad thing. Um, that's often how uh, different diseases are introduced to plants. Um, too much moisture on the foliage is not a good thing. Um, it can also lead to plants being scorched by the sun more easily. If you think about how um, a magnifying glass under the sun uh, creates a, a burning spot, um, droplets of water create the same effect on plants. So keep that in mind for when you are watering plants. 
Um, also doing any kind of overhead watering at night. Um, because they don't have the opportunity to dry out, um, that creates a good atmosphere for things like mildew um, and other different types of diseases to thrive. We'll get into that later. Um, watering at the right frequency is also important. Um, we talked a little bit about this, I believe in our first workshop. Um, so it's good to always keep an eye on weather reports as gardeners and farmers. Um, Weather reports are one of your best friends, and that's going to help you to predict when to water more um, or potentially water a little bit less if you're experiencing some cooler days. Um, but a good rule of thumb is to always give the soil surface, which we consider to be about the top half to one inch of the soil, a chance to dry out completely between waterings. Um, so in New Mexico, depending on what kind of outside temperatures we're experiencing, that could be every two to about four days. Um, and also keep in mind that that also depends on what kind of soil you're working with. If you have super healthy soil, uh, your, your soil could retain more moisture for longer. So um, a good way to test this is just to stick your finger in the soil um, and see how the moisture feels. Um, some of us have uh, reduced sensitivity in our fingertips um, from either injury or calluses or um, different types of illnesses. If that's the case for you, um, once you stick your finger in the soil, if you touch it to your upper lip, um, just between your nose and your upper lip, uh, that is a spot on your face that actually um, has a lot more sensitivity to moisture. Um, so that could be a handy tip if you are someone who is experiencing, um, yeah, the loss of uh, sensitivity to that in your fingers. Um, remember also that baby plants and seedlings that are just sprouting are going to need a lot more frequent waterings than more mature plants. Um, so making sure that you're keeping that soil where you have your seedlings planted uh, moist uh, will help to make sure that their roots can be established um, and that the plants can mature, um, at which point you can start to slowly reduce uh, the frequency that you water. Another tip is to water slowly and deeply. Uh, one of the best ways to accomplish that is either through using a drip irrigation, or you can also use a soaker hose. Those are also effective. Um, and the reason for that is that we want to give the water a chance to infiltrate all of the small spaces in the soil. And that way it can spread more evenly and more deeply to reach more of the deeper tap roots of plants which sometimes could reach a depth of 12 inches or more. Um, and that's especially important if you are uh, growing different root crops like carrots, beets, or turnips. Um, it's gonna be really important to make sure that those types of crops have access to water deep below the soil surface. Um, and another um, kind of tip with that that's not included in the slide, but um, actually roots really need to have that, um, that drying out period um, for the soil surface. And the reason for that is that it um, encourages roots to reach deeper to get to a water table. Um, so that's one of the reasons that watering too much is not a good thing. Um, it doesn't give root crops the opportunity to build strength and resilience, um, which is sometimes why we see um, things like radishes or carrots that turn into little tiny babies and never actually grow. So um, yeah, just something to keep in mind there. We can go to the next slide. So. Besides watering, fertilizing is um, the other most important thing in taking care of plants. Um, and just, um, 
yeah, something else to keep in mind is just that every living thing on the planet has a need for nutrition. Um, nutrition needs might vary from different species, but they all need something. <laughs> um, and most of them need the same types of elements that, um, that soil does. So um, plants typically need 13 identified different nutrients to grow. Those can include different minerals and nutrients, including um, copper, ion, iron, <laughs> uh, boron, um, magnesium, lots of different types of vitamins that we ourselves also need. Um, but the most important ones that uh, gardeners and farmers kind of focus on are the macronutrients, which are nitrogen, which is often uh, displayed as the letter N, uh, phosphorus, the letter P, and potassium, or sometimes it's also called potash, uh, which is the letter K. When you are purchasing fertilizer, you will often see three numbers displayed on the package uh, somewhere. Sometimes it's uh, displayed more like uh, the nutrition facts that you'll see on different types of food. Um, but most often it's displayed in big numbers right on the front. Um, and it'll be displayed um, in three numbers separated by dashes, usually something like 10, 50, 10, which represents the percentage of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that are in the mix. And it's always going to be in that order. Um, so when a fertilizer has a number displayed for all three of those macronutrients, it's considered a complete fertilizer, um, meaning that it provides complete macronutrition. When it only has one or two of the nutrients, it's called an incomplete fertilizer. And those types are most useful if you know exactly what kind of nutrients your plants need a boost of. Um, each nutrient is gonna play a really critical role in plant development. Um, there's definitely a lot of depth that we can get into in explaining the different functions of each type of nutrient. Um, there's tons and tons and tons of <laughs> different academic um, articles and things that you can read about that. But, we're gonna skip the science lesson for today. <laughs> We're gonna to get to the essential basics, um, which will help you to identify your plant needs a lot more easily. So nitrogen uh, is responsible for the vegetative growth, which includes the leaves and stems. So this is basically gonna be all of the foliage that you see above the ground. Um, phosphorus is responsible for root growth and development, and also for the development of fruits and flowers beforehand. Um, so that's going to be things that are underground and the things that the plant produces. Potassium is responsible for moving the water, nutrients, and carbohydrates and sugars through the plant. Um, so that's kind of like um, our cardiovascular system in our bodies. Um, it helps to transport everything that the plant needs to the different parts um, to make sure that everything is able to function properly. Next slide, please. So going back to the different types of fertilizers that you can use, um, they're pretty much just separated between two different types. Um, there's organic fertilizers, which are typically best for supplying a big variety of the different nutrients that plants need. So keeping in mind that plants need 13 different nutrients and minerals to function. Um, 
organic fertilizers are going to be able to provide more of those types of nutrients in less concentrated amounts. Um, Organic fertilizers are always made from things that were once alive or are byproducts of a living creature. So examples of organic fertilizers include compost, um, fish emulsion, blood meal, bone meal, uh, manure, um, earthworm castings, kelp or algae or seaweed are also some examples of that. Uh, and then synthetic fertilizers are the other type. Um, so these are typically gonna be the things that you see in packages or bottles. Um, these are fertilizers that are manufactured um, chemically. Typically, well, not typically, always <laughs> from inorganic sources. Um, so they're created in a laboratory typically um, on an industrial scale. Uh, they're usually labeled on fertilizer packages or bottles as ammonium nitrate, which is the nitrogen, ammonium phosphate, which is the phosphorus, and potassium sulfate, which is your potassium source. Um, we kind of have a tendency to separate organic uh, and synthetic as being good versus bad. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, it's actually often necessary that you'll have to use both organic and synthetic fertilizers to get optimal results. Um, and also remember that, um, you know, there are, there are other chemicals that we use for taking care of plants um, and ourselves even that still have a place, even though they may not be naturally produced. Um, that said, if you are concerned about growing organically, if that label is something that's really important to you, which I think it is for most of us, um, you can always check fertilizer labels for the OMRI certification which means that it has been approved for organic use. Um, and that basically ensures that it is something that is safe uh, for uh, being able to consume the product at some point. Um, another tip, uh, if you are uh, concerned with organic or natural use of fertilizers is that you can make your own too. Um, we've already gone into some depth on composting, um, so that's a great option. Um, but you can also look into things like making compost tea, uh, which is an extract of the compost that you make um, that creates a higher concentration, um, which means that you can extend the use of that for longer. Um, there's another type that's called uh, Jadam fertilizers, um, which was developed by a Japanese scientist, and I can't remember his name. Um, but basically, that is the use of um, incorporating different plant materials or um, fruit and vegetable scraps to make a microbe um, concentrated fertilizer like a liquid fertilizer. Um, and then there's another type of composting called bokashi. Um, that's another um, Asian uh, originated type of composting uh, that basically uses different types of grains like rice or barley or wheat in some cases to um, increase the microbial um, population of different types of compost. So check those out. They're super interesting and they're super, super easy to make and free for you to make. So um, yeah, definitely check those out. So a big question on fertilizer is when do you apply it? Uh, when are the right times to use fertilizer? Um, so 
the most crucial times to apply fertilizer are going to be between the different growth stages of plants. Um, because those are going to be the times when plants are expending the most amount of energy and need the most support. Uh, so if you think about, um, you know, your little ones, um, kids, um, you know, we, we give them lots of milk for getting calcium and their vitamins when they're young um, so that we can help to build their body's resilience. Um, so if you think about plants in the same way, um, we need to make sure that we're giving plant babies enough nutrition when they're young so that they can grow into healthy, mature plants. Um, so the times to fertilize, um, according to the growth stages, are going to be before planting so that seeds have um, more energy to allow them to break through the soil surface and produce their first leaves. Um, the second time is when plants start to produce their flowers. Uh, and that is going to give them more fuel to increase the number of flowers that they produce. Um, which will attract more pollinators and provide um, more opportunity for those fruit or sorry those flowers to turn into fruits. And then the third stage is once plants actually begin uh, turning those flowers into fruits. Um, and that is going to allow the fruits that your vegetable and fruit plants are producing to grow big, um, to have a higher nutritional value themselves, um, and just provide you with a much more plentiful harvest. You can also give additional fertilizer feedings um, about every three to four weeks, as long as the plant is alive. Um, and as long as you have well draining and porous soil. So you don't want to apply it that often if you're using um, soil that has a lot of clay in it, which unfortunately is most of New Mexico. Um, so for us, typically, um, it's better um, if you're fertilizing plants that are in the ground uh, to fertilize more like every four to six weeks. And Observation uh, is really key to knowing when to fertilize or not. Um, looking at the plant foliage and the color um, is gonna be a really good indicator for when you might want to apply more fertilizer. Um, if plants are looking super vibrant, um, they're a nice um, like a medium green color, um, and they're doing all the things they're supposed to be. They're producing flowers, they're producing fruit. Um, that's a good indicator that they're happy and healthy. Um, so you may not need to apply fertilizer as much, um, in which case you can just stick to the main growth stages and that should be plenty. So um, the other question for applying uh, fertilizer and nutrients to plants is how to know what nutrients your plants are needing. Like what, what might they be deficient in that um, will give you an opportunity to choose the right fertilizer for your plants. Um, a soil test is always gonna be the most accurate way to identify what your plants need. Um, that's not always feasible. Sometimes uh, soil tests can cost um, up to like $50 if you're looking at a really in-depth type of soil test. Um, there are some less expensive uh, basic soil tests that, that you can do. Um, but yeah, that's not always a practical solution. Um, so again, observation is going to be the most practical way to identify what your plants need. Um, and also keep in mind that your plants might be deficient in more than one nutrient at a time. So uh, the different types of symptoms that you're observing in your plants, um, it could be a combination of things. 
So let's get into that. So keeping in mind what our three macronutrients are for plants, um, there are some easy ways to identify how, um, yeah, how your plants uh, are deficient just by looking at them. So for a nitrogen deficiency, um, this is typically gonna look like the little picture of corn you see here. Um, it's going to appear first in the more mature leaves. So um, it'll usually start with them kind of becoming discolored. Uh, usually that starts with a pale yellow kind of color. Um, they'll turn like yellowish green, new growth will stop. Um, you'll start to see, uh, like you can see the veins of the leaves in this picture starting to turn brown. Um, I observe this a lot in my houseplants <laughs> um, because keep in mind that that's a very like contained atmosphere or environment for plants. Um, they don't have that um, natural introduction to uh, nutrients and minerals that plants that are in the ground might have. So um, anything that you're keeping in containers, you might see a lot more of these symptoms, a lot more um, exaggerated. Um, phosphorus deficiency, um, that's typically going to result in having um, leaf edges that start to turn first like a bluish green kind of color. Um, you'll definitely know um, just based off of what your plants are supposed to look like that the color is a little bit off. That's a really good first indicator. Um, they'll often start to lose their shine. Um, so they'll kind of become like uh, just really dull. Um, they'll look like they're kind of dusty almost. Um, and then the edges will start to turn like red or purple. And sometimes if there's a really severe deficiency of phosphorus, um, the leaves will actually start to turn more yellow in the center um, with those edges that kind of stay like a red or purple color. Um, so it's really easy to identify what a phosphorus deficiency is gonna look like. Um, potassium deficiency. This one is a little bit more difficult because it can actually look like a lot of other um, diseases that plants are susceptible to. Um, but usually it starts on older leaves and it'll start with the yellowing between the leaf margins. So you can see in this picture here um, that it's really kind of centered in between the little leaf veins. Um, and that's where it'll start. It'll begin spreading. Um, and usually this is gonna result in um, plants that wilt really easily. The leaves will kind of curl and they will scorch because remember that potassium uh, is responsible for moving the nutrients and the water through plants. So it'll start to take on the appearance of not getting enough water, of not getting enough nutrients. Um, and that's why. Um, the growth will be stunted. If it does produce any new growth, the leaves are gonna be super small. Um, so those are really good indicators of it being specifically a potassium deficiency. So that was a lot to cover. <laughs> I'm gonna give it uh, over to you all for some questions if you have any on that section. And you can put it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourselves also. Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Jose. <laughs> Sorry, this is my mic stopped working for a while. Hey, uh, so my question would be, uh, could you give us more information on how to create our own composting? On regular composting? Yeah. No, no, no. Compost tea. Oh, okay. Compost tea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you might have seen, uh, we put a little post on our um, Facebook and Instagram pages. Um, so 
there's a couple different ways that you can make compost tea. Um, my favorite way to do it is um, if you've been working on making your own compost, you can just take um, a big handful of that. Um, or if you have purchased compost from somewhere, you can use that too. Um, another method that people use is to actually use um, a handful of soil from the forest or here in New Mexico, um, like the Bosque area. Um, so just a handful, that's all you need. Um, you wanna get a five gallon bucket and fill it up with water. Um, if you're using tap water, you want to wait 24 hours before you add anything to it um, because tap water typically is chlorinated, uh, which kills all of the microbes that you want to have in your compost tea. So let it sit outside under the sun for 24 hours so that all the chlorine evaporates. Then you want to mix your handful of the compost or forest soil in there. Stir it up really good, um, cover it lightly, um, and you can basically just let that sit. Um, you can do anywhere between like three, two to three days, or some people really like to extend it further. Um, you can do three months if you want to. Um, I usually keep mine within like two to three weeks. Um, and you wanna stir it every day so that you get the air uh, airflow going through there. And you can tell that it's done when you see like a really nice layer of foam that collects on top. Um, and it'll kind of be like, um, like a soda almost, like all this fizz that kind of um, raises up to the surface. And those are uh, your microbes uh, respirating. Um, so the more foam that you see, that means the more microbe um, population that you have in there. Um, so once you have that made, um, that's actually like a super high concentrated um, liquid fertilizer that you can use, just like the ones that you buy at the store. Um, so in that case, you can pretty much use like one tablespoon of that liquid to a gallon of water to dilute it and water all of your garden, <laughs> all of your plants, just with that little amount. So um, it's a really, really awesome option for extending your compost. Um, like I said, I mean, some people let it sit for three to four months. You can let it sit as long as you want to, as long as you are stirring it regularly, it's just gonna continue to um, get better. And you can keep adding more stuff to it. Um, if you start to see the amount of foam kind of um, reducing, uh, just give it more vegetable scraps or use more compost um, to add in there and that'll keep it going indefinitely. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll yep. try it. Thank you so much. Let's see. I see we've got some stuff in the chat too. Let's see. Angelo says, if my leaves are yellow, oh, um, cool. So yeah, if you're seeing yellowing leaves, um, that's usually a really good indicator of either a nitrogen deficiency or it could be a potassium deficiency, depending on the kind of pattern of the yellow that you're seeing. Um, so yeah, if it's kind of starting from like the tips of the plants, uh, I'm sorry, tips of the leaves, and extending toward the base of the stem, um, that's probably nitrogen. If it's more in the middle of the margins between uh, plant leaves, that's more than likely going to be a uh, potassium deficiency. Can if I it doesn't look like either of those, it could be something else. <laughs> so we'll get into that too. 
can I use crushed up eggs and um, crushed up eggshells and and ash together, or would that be too much? Um. Well, let's see. So, based on that, what what do you think it might be a, a nutrient deficient in? Do you think it might be the nitrogen or the potassium? <laughs> I think it might be nitrogen because they're beans. Okay, yeah, no, that makes total sense. <laughs> they're, they're bare, so I have, I, when I have like peas and beans in the same plot or in different squares and the beans, the leaves are really, really, they're growing, but they're not growing as big as they were. I'm, I'm assuming they're supposed to because they're uh, bare paw beans and they're okay. supposed to grow up, but they're yellow. Yeah, so, um... I think one of the best ways that you can apply um, nitrogen um, probably is going to be something like manure um, or even like um, coffee grounds might be a good boost okay. that would, um, yeah, kind of like dry. Can I use dried dried chicken manure? Would be good. Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, especially because if you're thinking about um, like a bean plant, um, even if they're getting close to being harvested, it grows the beans above ground. So they're not going to come into contact with manure. So you wouldn't have to worry about anything like that. Um, okay. Yeah. And then the eggshells and um, the wood ash, you could definitely use that if it's looking more like a potassium deficiency. Those are both going to be really awesome sources of increasing that. Can I show you a visual of it, I guess? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay. Can you see that? Um, no, I think you've got your um, background turned on. Let's see here. It's only catching your face. <laughs> yeah. Can you see that now? Mm -mm. No. Oh, okay. Dang it. You could, um, if you want, you could send a picture actually to our um, Facebook group um, and we can look at it on there. Um, and that way, um, yeah, I think it would be great for other participants too to kind of see what you're dealing with. Maybe they're um, kind of having some of the same problems. So um, yeah, we can go into a deep kind of discussion on that if you're up for it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Uh, let's see here. Cool. Um, is bagged cow manure a good fertilizer? Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the nice things about using the bagged um, cow manure is that it has gone through the aging process, um, which means that it's gonna be uh, not quite as concentrated. Um, sometimes super high concentrations of the nitrogen that is in um, like cow manure can actually burn your plants. So yeah, if you use a bagged cow manure, that's gonna make sure that um, it's not going to burn your plants if you use it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, <laughs> and Wells also says, um, yeah, it also is good to make sure that it's been properly aged because it smells really bad. <laughs> so if you do apply that to your garden, it is going to smell like a rodeo for a while. Um, so yeah, make sure that you're using the, the aged stuff. Uh, Jose also asked, would cover cropping help nutrient deficiency? Absolutely. Um, Legumes, um, so things like clover, um, alfalfa actually is a legume, um, peas are also a legume. Um, 
all of those plants are going to, um, they develop nodules on their roots um, that specifically feed the microbes in the soil, which helps to circulate more nitrogen uh, through the soil uh, to the plants. So using cover cropping as um, a fertilizer is a really, really effective way uh, to do that. Um, you can also use cover cropping, um, kind of like the, the chop and drop method, which is uh, mowing, mowing down uh, all the greenery that you have um, and letting that um, either sit on top of the soil to decompose slowly over time to produce carbon in the soil, uh, or you can uh, work it into the soil a little bit. Um, it's not so easy to do that while you're growing plants um, that you're trying to produce a crop from, but um, yeah, doing that in between seasons is really, really effective. Let's see. And <laughs> awesome. Yeah, using unaged manure. That's not fun. Um, cool. So getting into our next section, um, this is going to go more into diseases and pests that are really common. Um, so keeping in mind, uh, you know, some of the symptoms that you might see in your plants of nutrient deficiencies, um, like I said, sometimes uh, what you're seeing uh, may not exactly look like either one of those deficiencies. It might look like more than one. Um, so yeah, in some cases where it's not easily identifiable as one of those macronutrient deficiencies, um, it could be something else. So if your plants aren't looking good, <laughs> um, Make sure that you check under leaves, look at the base of your plant. Um, typically, you'll see some really good indicators that what you're dealing with is not a nutrient deficiency. Um, and keep in mind, um, when it comes to diseases and pests, prevention is going to be your best uh, method of action. If you can prevent things from happening in the first place, <laughs> it's going to be a lot easier than trying to control it down the road. Um, so getting into some of the most common ones that you're going to see, um, and keep in mind, this is not an extensive list. There are lots of other ones. Um, if what you're seeing isn't looking like any of these, um, the New Mexico State University Extension Office actually provides a free diagnosis service. Uh, so you can contact them and show them pictures of what you're dealing with, and they can often tell you uh, what it is and tell you how to control it, tell you how to prevent it, um, give you lots of really useful information. So these are the really basic ones. Um, first one, bacterial leaf spot. Um, this one can kind of look like a potassium deficiency, um, but ways that you can identify it are, um, for one, that it thrives more in wet and cold conditions. So if you've created that kind of environment by uh, using like overhead watering or sprinklers at night that keeps your plant foliage moist, it could be bacterial leaf spot. Characteristics are tiny little black spots. Usually they have like a yellow halo around the spots and it'll be concentrated mostly on the leaves. So prevention, using drip irrigation instead of the overhead watering, that will um, prevent that kind of environment from allowing the disease to populate. Controlling it, 
Um, the best way is going to be using a fungicide. Um, and remember, um, chemicals aren't always bad. <laughs> Sometimes they are really useful. If organic is something important to you, look for the OMRI certification. Um, and that will indicate that that's going to be something that is safe for organic use. Blossom end rot is one that we see a lot, um, mostly on tomatoes, but it can actually affect other types of nightshade plants as well. So you could see it in your chili plants, you could see it in bell peppers, eggplant, um, you can also actually see it in potatoes. And it's gonna look like a big brown rotten spot on the bottom of the fruit where, um, um, where the blossom has fallen off. Um, and it's actually not a disease. It is actually um, a sign of calcium deficiency. Um, so a lot of people think that the first mode of attack for controlling this uh, issue is to spray it with something that's not going to solve the problem. Um, it is going to be something that you need to apply to the soil. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that um, to prevent it, first of all, is to apply a form of calcium to the soil before planting. Um, eggshells are going to be a really good way to do that. Um, powdered milk is also a really uh, cost-effective um, method of doing that. Um, so either, yeah, applying that before you plant or sprinkling, sprinkling it around your plant bases, once you start to see that problem, uh, should help to control it. Blight is another disease that is super common. Um, Mostly, um, as far as vegetable plants go, um, you'll see it in nightshades uh, the most. So again, it's going to uh, affect your tomatoes, your eggplants, your pepper and chili plants. Um, but there are different types that can affect other plants as well. Um, I actually just discovered that I have a blight uh, infection in one of my pine trees. Um, and it's actually something that is massively affecting our ponderosa pine population in New Mexico um, and um, pinions as well. Um, so blight <laughs> is not a fun thing to deal with. Um, usually it's identifiable by having um, dark circles um, on the leaves. And you'll kind of see like a little like spiral pattern within those spots. Um, on different types of plants, it can look like, um, yeah, just sort of like banded um, discolorations on the leaves. Um, it can also affect the stems or the fruits of plants. Uh, the best way to avoid it is to um, prevent any kind of like cold and wet atmospheres. Um, it's also challenging because different types of blight um, can also be produced by having hot and dry conditions. But the main thing that you want to focus on is allowing airflow. Um, so if you have a blight problem, um, kind of pruning the foliage could be something that helps to keep it in check. But you'll definitely want to treat it with a fungicide as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, if it's affecting a lot of the plant, the best thing is to just pull it out. It's not going to make it. <laughs> There's nothing that you can do that's going to salvage it. Um, and you're going to want to dispose of that plant. Um, uh, in some way that prevents it from spreading. So could be just throwing it in a trash bag. Um, you could also burn it. Um, just make sure that you're not throwing it in a compost pile. It will spread. Um, yeah, keep it away from anything else that you're growing. Downy mildew, um, it's a type of fungus. Um, 
This one we don't see quite as much in Albuquerque. Usually it's more, um, more seen in the colder and wet conditions. So you might see it more in like the northern parts of the state or higher elevations. Um, but it'll have this really uh, distinct um, yellowing pattern on the leaves. Um, they're kind of like angular um, spots. So they'll look like little like cube kind of shapes. Um, in later stages, it might start to grow like some gray fuzz, like actual mold. Um, but again, drip irrigation is going to be one of your best friends um, to prevent these kinds of diseases. Um, they like being in environments where the leaves are wet and don't have a chance to dry out. Um, same as blight, just treat it with a fungicide. And again, if it's affecting a lot of the plant, just pull it out and dispose of it. Powdery mildew is the type of mildew that you're going to see a whole lot more often, <laughs> um, especially here in New Mexico, because it thrives in warm and dry conditions. Um, this is one that's going to affect all different types of plants. Um, a lot of people see it on rose bushes, um, but it can also affect tomato plants. Um, cucumbers are super susceptible. Um, pretty much anything. It's really um, distinguishable by um, just basically looking like a powder that's been sprinkled on your plants. Um, usually it'll begin on the underside of plants, which is one of the reasons that it's really important when you're checking your garden to look at the undersides of your leaves. Um, Sometimes just looking at them from, you know, a bird's eye view is um, not going to give you those initial signs that you need to watch out for. But one of the best ways to um, prevent powdery mildew is just to prune your plants regularly. You want to make sure that there's enough airflow throughout the foliage um, and also use drip irrigation because Splashing plants with overhead watering or sprinkling uh, can cause those mildew spores to spread. Um, but one of the good things about powdery, powdery mildew um, is that it's host specific. So once it shows up on a plant, um, it's typically not going to spread to other species or varieties of plants. It's going to stay on the type of plant that it's already growing on. So it'll only be on your carrots or it'll only be on your tomatoes. Um, so it makes it a little bit easier to control in that way. Um, but the best way uh, to control it is to just remove any of the diseased leaves that you see. Uh, you can use a fungicide or you can also use a homemade solution uh, using baking soda. Um, Keep in mind that baking soda, um, sometimes it doesn't, um, doesn't dissolve properly. So make sure that when you're making the solution that it is dissolved and that when you apply it, it's gonna be in very early morning or late in the evening um, so that it doesn't scorch your plants if you apply it during the day. It's one tablespoon of baking soda a half teaspoon of non-detergent liquid soap. So that could be something like a Castile soap, like Dr. Bronner's or something similar to one gallon of water. Um, and that should be enough to control it. Verticillium wilt, that's a hard word to say, <laughs> is a, a soil-borne fungus. Um, that's going to invade plants through the roots and attacks the water cells of plants. So this is something that's also going to kind of replicate the symptoms of a potassium deficiency. Um, it's going to create curled foliage, discoloration, and severe wilt. Um, it's, it's a really difficult disease um, to deal with. Um, and I'm going to explain why. <laughs> um, 
It can live in the soil for up to 10 years. Um, so it's really difficult to prevent because you can't see it unless you're growing something that is affected by it. Um, so one of the best tips that I can give you is don't buy plants from nurseries that look like they're sick. Um, I know I have this problem whenever I go into a nurse, a uh, plant nursery that I want to rescue plants that look sad. Uh, don't do that <laughs> with your vegetable plants. They could be harboring some kind of disease or a pest that you do not want to introduce to your garden. Um, another way that you can prevent this disease is to purchase seed varieties or plant varieties that are resistant to it. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done to create um, specific varieties of plants through ongoing breeding pro uh, programs to combat these types of diseases. Um, so you can do a little bit of research. Um, there's a ton of different options that are, um, yeah, great for our climate. So um, check those out. Controlling this disease, um, Sadly, <laughs> if you see this, you're going to need to remove and destroy your infected plants as soon as possible. Um, solarization is the best way to kill the um, disease in the soil. Um, so the way to do that, you'll wanna till the top six inches of the soil, saturate it really well with water and cover it with uh, plastic. Clear plastic is probably going to be best because you want to have that um, like magnifying glass effect that's going to burn the fungus. Um, make sure you secure the plastic and leave it there for at least a month um, during a hot and dry period, which shouldn't be difficult in New Mexico in the summer. Um, and really just allow it to um, have that time to kill the fungus that's in the soil. It's a really bad disease, you don't want it. Um, mosaic virus is another one um, that you really don't wanna see in your garden. Um, this one is a viral disease, which means that um, much like other viruses that affect humans um, and other living species, um, it's highly contagious, and there's often not a cure for it. Um, it's almost always going to be fatal um, for plants. Um, and this one can also be hard to identify because it looks different in every type of plant that it affects. Um, but most often, you're gonna look for raised yellow splotches and uh, really obvious deformities of the leaves and the fruits. Um, mosaic virus can actually be spread from cigarette tobacco, which is one of the most common ways that it is spread to vegetable plants. Um, it can also spread through insects like aphids um, or flea beetles. Um, and it can also spread by coming into contact with different tools uh, that have been um, infected with the virus. Um, so if you're a smoker, um, always wash your hands after you smoke, um, before you touch any plants or tools that you're using regularly in your garden. Um, always destroy diseased plants. Um, and sanitize tools uh, in between tasks. Um, that should be kind of a regular practice for you um, in general, um, just because we don't want to um, introduce different types of diseases or pests to other plants that we're coming into contact with. Um, and again, this is one that does not have a cure. Um, it can live in the soil for up to two years and unfortunately, solarization is not going to be effective in killing it. So best thing is to just quarantine the area um, for that long. So yeah, don't want that one <laughs> affecting your garden either. Um, going into pests, aphids, 
you've all seen them. <laughs> they are um, terrible, terrible little insects to have. Um, they're super destructive despite their size. Um, usually uh, you'll see them um, or notice actually their effects by the yellowing or wilting of leaves. Um, you'll usually see like a really sticky residue and that's from the sugars that they excrete, um, which is also, um, it's a food source for ants. So often when you see aphids, um, they're also gonna bring a lot of ants with them. Um, best way to control them or prevent them is to encourage predator insects. Um, ladybugs, lacewings, and praying mantis are all predators that love to eat aphids. So the more you have of those guys, uh, the less of an aphid population you're gonna have. Um, you can make a homemade insecticidal soap spray, um, which is basically the same as the baking soda recipe, um, but without the baking soda. Just use like a half teaspoon of a non-detergent soap to one gallon of water and make sure that you spray it only in the early morning or in the early, I'm sorry, in the late evening. Um, and it might take a couple applications to get rid of them. Colorado potato beetles, sadly, they are not exclusive to Colorado. <laughs> they also affect New Mexico and many other places. Um, they are gonna look like um, sort of the shape of a ladybug, but they're gonna have yellow and black stripes. Um, they're gonna cause holes in your foliage. Um, they'll eat entire leaves and they're gonna be very, very visible. They uh, repopulate very quickly. So you'll usually see them uh, even before you see the damage to plants. They also usually prefer nightshade plants. So most common in your tomatoes, um, peppers and eggplants. Best way to prevent them is to use row cover early in the season. Um, that prevents them from laying eggs on your plants um, during their normal breeding season. That'll control the population later on. Um, and always make sure that you're rotating your crops um, because they can stay in the soil over the season. So um, if you move your nightshade crop to a different spot in your garden the next season and use the row cover in combination, that will prevent them from affecting your plants the next year. Um, controlling them, best way is to just scrape off the eggs from the plants um, and remove as many beetles as you can find and drown them <laughs> in a bucket of soapy water. Um, Killing them, unfortunately, is the best way to get rid of them. Um, you can also spray them with a neem oil. Um, and if you don't know what neem oil is, it's a natural oil that's derived from the neem plant. Um, it is OMRI certified. Um, so that is something that is safe to use. Um, and if you're using it in small concentrations, it's typically not going to affect your pollinator populations. Um, cutworms, those are another super common one. Um, they are moth larvae. Um, so if you see little white moths around your garden, those are what these guys turn into. Um, Unfortunately, moths are also really great uh, pollinators. So um, yeah, it's unfortunately um, one of those balances um, that, yeah, we don't wanna have a high population of them um, because they can be destructive, but they are also a good thing. So um, they often live in the soil um, and they come out at twilight hours. Um, and typically eat the stems of plants. It's easily identifiable when you have these guys, um, even if you can't see them, because they will entirely cut through the stems of plants or entirely cut uh, leaves. Um, and usually they stay concentrated at the base of plants. 
So um, yeah, you'll usually see like shriveled and dying plants because obviously the plant can't get the water and the um, nutrients that it needs. Um, prevention, you can actually use like little um, paper towel or toilet paper tubes and cut them like small enough that it's not going to um, like shade your plant too much or like constrict leaf growth, um, but just to like prevent like a barrier um, from them being able to get to the stem of your plant. Um, you can also use different methods to encourage predators. Um, so beneficial insects, um, praying mantises like these guys, um, there are also um, predatory wasps that also eat these guys. Um, so those are good bugs to have. And then to also have a bird population. Um, obviously berm, birds <laughs> love worms. So um, yeah, if you have like a bird feeder out, um, yeah, encouraging some, some bird population is gonna be really great for controlling these guys. You can also use diatomaceous earth, which is another um, natural product that is created from um, ground up fossils, <laughs> basically. Um, and you can also use coffee grounds. Um, those are going to deter cut cutworms from uh, attacking the base of the plant. Um, usually spraying plants uh, when you have this problem is not going to work because they live in the soil. Um, so anything that you can actually apply just to the soil is going to be more beneficial. The other one that you're going to see a lot of are flea beetles. Um, these guys act and look just like fleas. They're just a little bit bigger than fleas. Um, and they lay their eggs at the base of plants. Um, so these are another guy, another, um, yeah, <laughs> another insect that um, you're primarily going to see the effects of them uh, begin at the base of plants, where the larvae hatch, um, they'll eat through the roots, um, and then start to work their way up to the top of the plant as they mature. Um, they cause huge holes. Um, throughout the plant, um, super, super easy to identify these guys. Um, using row cover early in the season will help to prevent them from laying those eggs in the first place. Um, you can also sprinkle the base of plants with diatomaceous earth uh, to prevent them from laying eggs um, and then controlling them dusting the plants with some kind of talcum powder, um, like a baby powder, um, will be re really effective for that. Or you can also use a insecticidal spray that is specific for flea beetles. And then the last two, <laughs> these are uh, often considered our biggest enemies in the garden. Um, Hornworms, um, super easy to identify. They look just like this guy in the picture, um, like fluorescent green, and they'll have that little horn on the ends of their tail. Um, the sad thing about hornworms um, is that they're extremely destructive to tomato plants, um, but they are also one of the most valuable pollinators um, in the garden, including for tomato plants. <laughs> so, um, the best way to control these guys, um, we always we always have a tendency to want to kill pests to get rid of them. Um, for these guys, because what they turn into. Um, are sphinx moths. Um, they're the really big moths that you see that kind of resemble hummingbirds. Um, you want to keep those guys around. So 
if you can create some kind of special area that is just for like the relocation <laughs> of hornworms, you can prevent them from destroying your vegetable garden, but also give them a place where they can mature into those moths that are going to be super, super valuable for um, pollinating all of the plants in your garden. Um, for population control, you can also um, do things to attract more beneficial insects. So creating an environment um, with lots of pollinator plants um, to attract ladybugs. Um, those same kinds of environments are going to attract the parasitic wasps that prey on these guys um, to actually, um, <laughs> the way that they're effective is by laying their eggs in the hornworm. Um, and when they hatch, um, the hornworm becomes a food source for all of the little larvae that come out. So um, yeah. Super, super effective way of uh, <laughs> controlling those guys. Um, squash bugs are, yeah, probably the most difficult to control out of anything. Um, they repopulate super fast. They lay their eggs everywhere. Um, and they're really ugly. <laughs> they're just terrible. Um, they look like the little guy in the picture here, um, the adults, um, usually like a brownish gray color, their backs are flat, they look like stink bugs. Um, they also, just like stink bugs, have a stinky smell when you squish them. Um, the baby squash bugs, um, they're usually like a weird like blue gray color and they always move very fast. <laughs> uh, they're just super, ugh, they're awful, awful little bugs. Um, the way that they work is by actually injecting toxins into the plant stems that they feed on. Um, this causes yellowing in the plants um, that turns uh, brown first and then it turns black. Um, basically causing like little rotten spots um, that introduce um, disease. Um, it's just really, really destructive. Um, some of the ways that you can control them is to rotate your squash crops and use a row cover early in the season. Um, when you're using row cover, you want to just make sure that you're um, removing it once your plants start to remove or produce flowers, um, because obviously your pollinators aren't going to have an opportunity to get to the flowers, which you need to be able to um, turn the fruit, I'm sorry, the flowers into fruits. So um, yeah, and then also plant nasturtiums. Wells um, gave us the super valuable tip to plant oregano around your uh, squash plants. Um, another effective one is to plant buffalo gourds, um, which are a roadside plant. They're really smelly. Um, and those will actually trick your squash bugs um, into believing your good squash plants are buffalo gourds. Um, so they're less likely to attack them. Um, controlling them, you just gotta stay on top of it. Um, if you find eggs, scrape them off as fast as you possibly can, uh, squish them. <laughs> um, a good way to kind of uh, get them into like a collected um, group so that you can squish more at a time is to put um, wet uh, lumber scraps like old like two by fours or even if you have like firewood that you can't use, um, wet it down, put it in between your rows um, around where your squash plants are. And at night, the bugs will actually um, hide 
under there. It's a perfect environment for them to, um, yeah, just kind of like hide from other predators. Um, and um, yeah, in the mornings or late in the evenings uh, before they're coming out for the day or uh, after they've kind of gone to bed. <laughs> Just turn over all of that wood and squish as many as you can. Um, these ones, there's nothing good about them. You can destroy at, at your <laughs> leisure. Um, so yeah, those are the main ones. Um, so oh, I just want to say um, the Spanish speaking version starts in just a few minutes. So okay. Um, there's a couple, I think one or two questions in the chat, if you want to see this. Awesome. Let's see. So, okay. So for sanitizing your tools, um, one of the best ways that you can do that is just to, um, you can dilute some bleach in water. Um, usually like a capful for one gallon is about all you need. Um, you can dip your tools in there. Um, you can also just use like a cloth that's wet with that solution and just wipe things off. Um, you don't really need a lot to be able to sanitize stuff. Um, and let's see the other question for hornworms, whether sources of food or plants, can they be re relocated to? Um, obviously, tomatoes are really their preferred source. Um, so if you can like create another um, space where you have just some scrap tomato plants <laughs> that they can feed on, that's the best thing. Another one that they're really attracted to is, um, it's called a datura plant. Um, it's also known as the moonflower. Um, that is one that um, you can plant kind of nearby that will also provide a really awesome source for pollinators. The flowers are really awesome um, and the hornworms love the leaves. So, um, Awesome, I think that kind of wraps everything up. Um, there's just some really quick little extra plant care tips here. Um, we'll go more into using shade cloths and protecting your plants from the climate and the environment in our next workshop. Um, that's gonna become an issue pretty soon as we get into the summer months. Um, and also just a nice reminder to talk to your plants and tell them positive things there's actually been scientific studies that uh, have proven that talking to your plants helps them grow. Um, and when you give them positive encouragement, it helps them even more. So talk to them, sing to them, be present with them. Um, it'll make them happy. So thank you all for being here. Um, just a reminder, next workshop um, scheduled for Saturday, June 11th. 11.30 to 12-ish for our English uh, workshop, 1 to 1.30 for Spanish. And um, yeah, we'll get all of the links and everything sent out to you um, before the workshop. So thank you all so much. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone. We went over a lot today, but it was a lot of good information. So I'm glad that you all could be here. Thank you.